Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we are going to talk about Microsoft Ignite. It's that time of year. Microsoft has its annual Ignite conference, which is a conference for Microsoft customers. And there were so many security announcements. We're actually going to split the Ignite stuff into two different shows. So this is going to be part one. And we're going to go over some stuff that was talked about at Ignite. And then part two, we're going to go over more because this was a banger of a year when it comes to security uh, announcements. I have never seen as many things announced in one single swoop as I did this year. And in fact, for me, it was a little bit overwhelming. I was trying to catch up on all the different things that we released. And so this was good for me to research the show and write down the notes. And hopefully our listeners and viewers will get something out of it as well. Absolutely overwhelming. And we get paid to understand all this. We, Andy and I both work for Microsoft and we're in our security business in, in the field. Um, and it, it was just a ton of announcements. And when Andy and I talked about this in the pre-show, I was musing out loud if part of this has to do with a, a realignment, reorganization that happened at Microsoft almost two years ago now. Uh, Microsoft had hired a gentleman by the name of Charlie Bell who came across Lake Washington from Seattle to Redmond uh, from Amazon, where he led AWS, uh, I think pretty much all up, and was hired to come into Microsoft and run security compliance, identity, endpoint management, and privacy. And when he joined, he was announced he would report directly to Satya Nadella, so Microsoft CEO, and sit on the senior leadership team. And all of those engineering functions, which were spread across Microsoft in different parts of the company, all came under Charlie Bell. And that happened about two years ago. So 24 months later, plus this whole AI revolution that's been going on, and you combine that to get an absolutely packed slate of announcements. And also, this was the first Ignite back with a full in-person component uh, it was held in Seattle at the new um, Seattle Convention Center, which is built like right across the street from the old uh, Washington State Convention Center, if you're familiar with that area on Pike Street there um, in downtown Seattle. And um, there were actually some uh, uh, breakout sessions and keynotes even that were Seattle only. You had to be in person to view them live. Now, they did say a lot of those would be recorded and posted later. But as of recording time, some of those sessions we hadn't even been able to view or review yet. So kind of cool to not only have an in-person component again, but even have some content held back exclusively for the folks who made the trip to the Puget Sound area. So that, that was kind of exciting for me, too, uh, just in terms of how Ignite was delivered. So many of these sessions were literally presenters on a day in person presenting to an audience with live Q and a and everything else. And that to me is really encouraging to see because um, not to go on a big tangent before we get into the meat of the show, but I will say when, when companies are talking about their own stuff, they're announcing, right? There's, there's obviously a, a self-interest component to that. Obviously Microsoft wants our customers to know about, the stuff we're making so they can buy it if they don't already own it. And when you do like a pre-recorded show, it comes off almost like an infomercial at this point, because really what's the difference between that and an infomercial? It's paid programming. It's we have created this thing that walks through all the cool stuff we created that you should now go buy and act now supplies are limited. And I think an in-person presentation doesn't come off with that same vibe. It's more educational Here's what we're doing. Here's why. Here's why you might want to use it. Here's how you can take advantage of it. Here's how you can consider that in your architecture. So I will say for me personally, I love 
having these in-person presentations. They land better with me. They're easier to follow and understand. And I think they come off less purely commercial and more educational. So more of this, please, Silicon Valley far and wide, more live, more in-person, more human, and less tightly edited and slickly produced infomercials, please. So love, love, love the in-person component to this. All right, let's dive right in. First, <laughs> yeah, I wasted too much time. Let's get to it. The first big announcement. And thank you for that, though, Adam, because that reorg, one of the things that Charlie Belt did last year was actually integrate the Defender for Endpoint and Sentinel teams under one engineering umbrella. Mm -hmm. And that's important because Sentinel used to be part of Azure and kind of was part of the Azure team. And Defender for Endpoint was part of the security or M365 team and the solutions while they integrated, oftentimes there wasn't communication. It was actually kind of shocking sometimes sitting in internal conversations and we'd be like, when is this coming to Defender for Endpoint or when is this coming to Sentinel? And the teams didn't know what capabilities were going to be integrated and what the roadmap looked like. So organizing it under one single engineering team resulted in one of the big first announcements, which was we're having a unified platform as powered by generative AI for MDE and Sentinel. It is combined. So XDR and SIM under one unified console, one unified platform. And so the features of both are going to be available in the security center in security.microsoft.com. It's currently in private preview. You have to be part of the security community in order to participate in the private preview. And there's actually a lot of these features that are in private preview. You have to be in the community in order to take part with it. I think this is huge because SIMs in general, if you think about the evolution of SIMs, they came around probably because you used to use a shared inbox with a bunch of alerts and just feed all your alerts to an email inbox. And then it got to be too much. And then now we have different machine type learning capabilities, you feed logs into something and then they alert off of that. But our XDR system, the Microsoft one, is able to contextualize alerts across identity, across email, across devices, endpoints. And that was always really well integrated on the Microsoft side. The SIM side, while there are connectors to connect that data to the SIM, and then you have other connectors for your firewalls, for your databases, you know, within Azure for Defender for Cloud and other things that you can connect with the SIM. Again, I think it's more analytics based. It looks at the logs, it sees an alert and it pops an alert, and then it can kind of connect alerts together. That's how all SIMs are. They just take alerts and kind of stitch them together. Whereas XDR, I think is a little bit smarter because it can really see the the core data as part of the integration. And so being able to integrate these two together, you basically have a unified platform that also can take advantage of that new feature we talked about a few weeks ago, the automatic attack disruption. That's available now for Sentinel, which is insane to me because for first party, yeah, it's kind of obvious we can look at stuff on Defender for Endpoint, Defender for Office, emails, all that stuff. But now you're able to look at all the Azure stuff. And if you have stuff integrated with Arc, that's Defender for Cloud. Azure Arc can bring in things that you're hosting in AWS. CNAP, you have third-party connectors like Okta, CrowdStrike, Palo Alto, Cisco. You take all that and feed it into the XDR platform and then provide automatic attack disruption for those type of alerts. Like for example, SAP signals. We're able to take data from Sentinel's SAP connection and use automatic disruption to disconnect native SAP from Microsoft Entra in order to stop any type of financial fraud techniques and prevent cyber attackers from transferring funds with no human intervention. I mean, that's to me just next level kind of stuff, right? And Security Copilot will be integrated 
into this as well, into Sentinel, because now it is integrated into Defender for Endpoint as part of the security platform. And one of the examples that I saw, you know, this is a question I get quite a bit, which is more skepticism from the security communities, from the security departments that I talk to, is how am I supposed to use generative AI? Like, I don't get what use it's going to be as part of my life. And I get that too, because honestly, I don't use generative AI too much as part of my daily life. But one of the things that I saw as an example was someone sitting down at their computer and then typing into security copilot. Tell me what alerts I should be aware of today. Think about like you're an analyst at the beginning of your day, you got a hundred alerts and you don't know where to start. You could just ask copilot, which one should I focus on? And the example that I saw popped up a bunch of different alerts and actually they were low priority. And so as a curious person in security, generally you are, you click on the one that says, well, why is this one low and why should I be aware of it? Well, as part of that low fidelity priority alert, there was a user who was high risk. And so that's what security copilot was triggering off of was, Hey, you should probably take a look at this alert because this user is high risk and doing risky behavior, you know, siphoning company data or having risky sign-ins or something like that. And so Copilot, you know, this generative AI can contextualize all these different types of alerts and surface things kind of like a third party sock, but at machine speed for you. And so that was just one of the things that I think of if I were to be a security analyst easily daily thing that I'd be doing. Right. And then digging in, Further, it can also do other things like analyze malicious scripts, crafting the Kusto query language, which I'm not an expert in. But if I wanted to ask Security Copilot to say, give me a query to see what users are high risk or which users receive this email titled this, right? You can do advanced searches with the Kusto query language just by querying Security Copilot to help you with a, a query. And then another thing you can do, which, you know, if you're in security, you know, you get asked all the time is you can provide an update to your senior leadership by asking security copilot to summarize in a polished report can generate a PDF for you or something like that to summarize an investigation, remediate remediation actions that were taken to resolve it. So a lot of things that are part of copilot, this show, as well as ignite tons of copilot announcements, but this is just a taste of it as part of that Sentinel and MDE integration. One of the things that's funny about this is there was a product rename snuck in here <laughs> and it's actually a what's old is new again. I'll give you a little inside baseball here. So in January of 2020, right before COVID began, I was in Seattle at the Hyatt Regency downtown being briefed on Microsoft launching our XDR solution. And that was going to bring together um, alerts from endpoint, from cloud identity, from on-premises identity, from SaaS protection uh, and email and file and, and malicious URL detection. And at the time they told us, we're going to call this Microsoft Defender XDR. And they must've gotten cold feet because it initially launched as Microsoft Threat Protection. And then it was later rebranded Microsoft 365 Defender. And now today, or last week rather, it was announced that we will now call it Microsoft Defender XDR. So the original name they told us three and a half years ago they were going to call it has now finally come to fruition. And one of the things to me is I think of XDR as a platform that brings in very high fidelity, not just alerts, but telemetry from the primary protective solutions you use across some of the primary threat vectors. So of course, endpoint, cloud identity, on-premises identity, SaaS applications, email, threat protection, plus I, I would add in team, SharePoint, OneDrive. And then it can take that telemetry and stitch that into incidents, not just alerts, but an incident where you have all of the telemetry in a timeline that you can work through. 
And obviously Microsoft has the ability to deliver that because they have protection for all those different security domains. And there's some other vendors that can do this too, like Palo Alto has a good XDR solution because they have a lot of that same stack. Although I would point out not one-to-one, they, they do a little more on the network side of the house. But then there's other vendors who, because they don't really have multiple solutions across different security domains, they, they claim they have XDR, but I'm skeptical if they really do. Or maybe they try to create an open platform XDR where they say, well, all these different solutions can plug into it. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's challenging as well to get right because of all the obvious challenges with it. So that's XDR. And then, Andy, you talked about, okay, well, when do you use XDR versus when you use SIM? Well, generally, SIM is I need to move beyond just that tooling. I need to bring in network devices or third-party applications or or those sorts of things. And the answer wasn't always clean on like, when do I do an investigation in XDR versus when do I do it in SIM? Well, you no longer have to choose. That's the big deal here because XDR and SIM are becoming a single security operations platform in the Microsoft world, where you'll go to security.microsoft.com and it will all be there. Your SIM and all of the connectors it has across first and third party, plus the really detailed incidents that are, by the way, automatically correlated in Defender XDR. And and then if you're a Security Copilot customer, you get that sidebar with Security Copilot where you can ask natural language questions about all the data you're working on. And Andy walked you through the use cases, but the number one thing I really wanna point out is, this is valuable to any analyst from junior level all the way up to very senior, because if you have threat intelligence just off the top of your head all of the time, I'm gonna be really impressed, especially nowadays with this current naming scheme of like Volt Typhoon and Cobalt Typhoon. Like I can't keep track of them. But if you can say, oh, this IP address is associated with Cobalt Typhoon or whatever, and I can just ask, what is Cobalt Typhoon? And you'll get the Microsoft Threat Intelligence report on it through Security Copilot. Super helpful. And then for junior analysts in particular, like Andy talked about, being able to deconstruct scripts and get an explanation of what they're doing, being able to translate natural language to Custo query language. And for everyone being able to automatically spin up reports, you can literally say, create a single slide in PowerPoint for a non-technical audience summarizing incident 298751 or whatever, and it will spit out, here's your PowerPoint file. And it's got a slide with a diagram of what happened as well as everything Andy talked about, an executive summary and remediation actions taken. Boom, done. Your reporting's done. Go turn that over to your CISO or your board or whomever and move on to the next incident. That's really, really powerful as well. So to me, I think it's easy in this industry to throw around terms like game changing, you know, game changer all the time. But this combination of XDR plus SIM plus AI and real AI, AI that is actually shipping and in the hands of customers right now, that is pretty unique, pretty differentiated for sure. So again, we both work for Microsoft. I think we're pretty excited about this. I think this is gonna really help empower defenders. And again, the great thing about competition is this gives the industry something to work toward as well, and then to even surpass in their own ways. And then Microsoft and other vendors will respond. That's the great thing about competition is it drives all of us to be better. But this to me feels like uh, one of the biggest advancements I've heard in a long time. Really, really excited about this. So let's talk about Copilot for a little bit. Copilot is getting (laughs) extended to data security, identity, device management, and other things with embedded capabilities and experiences across the Microsoft security portfolio. And one of the examples, because I, I do like tangible examples of this, is eDiscovery. So in one of the sessions that I sat through, because I've had to deal with e-discovery and lawyers and exporting our company's data, just putting it on a CD or USB drive and just handing it over versus like keeping it in house and, you know, finding that particular thing for litigation. Lawyers are also expensive. 
So think about using something like Security Copilot and being able to generate a report or find a specific email that's good. You know, think about how much lawyers cost to sort through that stuff manually or a paralegal, how much time that takes, right? If you need something, you can just ask eDiscovery and be like, give me all the emails that Adam sent to Andy in this period of that month and find the one on this day that he talked about this, right? This topic where he revealed security co-pilots, you know, capabilities and um, and that's what we need for our litigation. Something like that, right? That's just an example off the top of my head. But think about e-discovery and the ability to use e natural language to just query and find something within your company's data. And, and before you move on, Andy, I, I want to add on to that point because you just nailed it. In the kickoff keynote for Microsoft Ignite, one of the things Satya Nadella mentioned is that we are in the midst of a transition to where in many ways natural language is going to become the user interface through which you in a, you interact with a lot of applications that's really what's happening here we we're, we get are getting hung up on on some of the things like generative ai is really good at and really not good at but that's the ultimate outcome here is as opposed to the graphical user interface where i have to know where to point and click and check this box and push this button and do this thing i can describe in natural language what i want to do that's what's happening here is the user interface through which you do something is changing to be more natural language driven. I talked about using Custo query language, being able to generate that from natural language. I can just describe, hey, I wanna search for this. And the computer creates the query and then runs it if I ask it to. That's, that's really the paradigm shift here. So as Andy talked about, you may not be an expert in how to use eDiscovery, but you know how to explain what you want. You can write that in natural language. Well, now that tool opens up to you in a way maybe it never did before because you didn't know how to use it. You didn't have time to go through training or anything else. But everyone knows how to at least explain naturally what they want. That's a big deal. And that's ultimately where a lot of this is headed. Another example that I got was in Insider Risk under something we have called communication compliance, where you could search your company's communication to see if any type of threatening language was used, right, within teams or within um, uh, emails. You could also look at sensitive data. So communication compliance is, is bullying, it's, it's threatening language, it's also looking at your company data and seeing if anything was released there. So you could, again, use natural language and search without having to know how to do it within the tool, without having to scope the specific parameters. And so, like Adam said, everything becomes a lot easier. In Entra, you're able to say, summarize why a user risk is elevated or instantly get a summary of risk and remediation steps for a user, right? So and when you see all these risky sign-ins, you can ask, Security Copilot to summarize it for you, figure out which one is the the most risky, explain to you why that sign in was risky. You know, there's a lot of things that you can use um, as part of this extension of Copilot into Entra. And one of these other ones that I thought was really good is Entra ID governance. And so Entra ID governance has a new portion of it called life cycle management. So being able to automate the creation of users and then assigning applications to them as part of an onboarding or offboarding. And you could ask security copilot to guide you through the creation of a life cycle workflow so that you can easily onboard new employees, assign them to the security groups that you require assign them the applications that they need, the permissions that they need, and then when they leave, you can offboard them. And so that's a really good uh, use of Security Copilot. And another announcement, again, like 
Copilot was integrated into Intune. So now you have full visibility of your security data with full device context, and you can have real-time guidance into creating policies, which I think is, is great. And also, another example, which I personally would love to have at a company, you can have AI-based guardrails to help you understand the impact of a policy change before you apply them. Like how useful is that? Like I get that question all the time from my bosses when I used to scope policy is what's the impact? Who, who's going to be impacted by this? What's the scope of this change? And so now you can use Copilot to give you that exact um, guidance and tell you, how it's going to impact your organization. So you could say things like, if I were to begin requiring iOS 17 dot whatever, uh, how many devices would be marked as non-compliant? And it can tell you that. And you could find all that before. You could pull reporting and uh, plug in an Excel formula or whatever. But when you can just in natural language ask that and get the answer in the snap of a finger pretty compelling again natural language versus how do you know how to do it manually yeah and one of the things i'm just thinking as you said that you know i had a customer ask me a, a while back because they wanted to know who in their organization was using personal OneDrive because they wanted to block it and i said well you could just block it if you wanted to <laughs> and they he said yeah of course but i want to know the impact i want to know how many people are using it and how many are going to be impacted by this before I apply the policy, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. And there's not an easy way to do that. You can run a script to detect certain things, but imagine being able to just ask security copilot to do that for you. Tell me who is using personal OneDrive because that telemetry is there. It is part of um, Defender for Cloud Apps. And so it can differentiate between regular OneDrive and OneDrive for Business. So you could ask it, and it would tell you the impact of that, which I think is super cool. We have something called external tax service management, which was part of the acquisition of Risk IQ. There's some new co-pilot capabilities within that as well that can summarize your attack surface that is going to be available for external attackers. So think your external IP addresses, your certificates that are out there, your publicly available endpoints if you're hosting web apps and it can tell you whether or not you have vulnerabilities or exposures to that and um, what type of CVEs that are going to be um, that you're vulnerable to and then how to prioritize your remediation efforts based on the severity of those CVEs. And so you can use Copilot to help you basically organize your remediation and, and summarize your risk. To summarize, what has really changed here is initially when Security Copilot was announced, it was targeted at the Security Operations Center. And that was where all the focus was. And all these announcements, Andy just walked you through, extending it to Purview, extending it to Entra, to Intune. That now extends Security Copilot to be a useful tool for IT. If you're an IT professional and you manage endpoints in your environment, you now have a co-pilot you can call on to help understand, as Andy walked about, impact of changes or ask reporting questions, how many users are configured this way, and get those responses quickly. That's uh, a whole new audience for this tool that was not previously targeted by it. And keep in mind, this was only announced back in March. So we're eight months in, an early access program right now. So customers do have their hands on with it um, currently, but it, it keeps growing and getting extended. The, the rate of development here is really unbelievable. I, I just don't recall anything like this ever. And I think it's because everyone sees how impactful and useful this technology can be. And there's so many use cases that come to mind where it's, it's really, really helpful. And so everything Andy talked about, really cool stuff that even if you're not necessarily in the SOC 24 seven, if you're more security engineering, you're going to benefit from this as well. Yeah. And we're just talking about security copilot here for the most part, mm -hmm. you know, 
There were a slew of M365 <laughs> co-pilot announcements as well, as well mm-hmm. that we're not going to get into because we don't have, you know, three, four shows to <laughs> talk about everything. And if you're curious, I mean, you can use it, the co-pilot that drives a lot of the technology behind it because it's already integrated with Bing. So if you use Bing, it's become my default search because I can just type in natural language into it. I, in fact, used it right before this show. As an example, my son's computer has had some issues. It keeps on rebooting. And so I just asked Security Copilot, or not Security Copilot, but Bing, powered by Copilot, Mm -hmm. the question of, you know, give me reasons why a computer would randomly reboot. And it summarized a bunch of things, right? Mm-hmm. Out of date drivers, power supply, you know, all sorts of things. And then it gave references that I could go click on and then, you know, figure out more stuff. So it's really kind of starting to make its way into my life. And I showed an example on Friday where I joined a meeting late and security, or not security, I keep on saying security co pilot, but Copilot, M365 Copilot in Teams asked me, would you like to summarize what you've missed so far? Because I was 15 minutes late to an hour meeting. And I thought, sure, give, give me a summary. And it summarizes, she said, this person introduced this person who's an expert in this and started talking about this. And here are the things that you missed so far. And you can do that for meetings. In fact, my wife asked me if co-pilot for teams was going to be free because she often misses meetings in her organization and she would love to have a tool that could summarize the meeting that she missed so that she could get the key points and so those are some really amazing tools in my opinion Mm -hmm. for not only security but obviously here in productivity yeah and before you pivot and this is actually kind of on topic to where we're going next uh the the Branding was kind of clarified here. So the overarching brand is Microsoft Copilot, and then Microsoft Copilot is available in different experiences. So Andy talked about the product that was formerly Bing Chat is now Microsoft Copilot in Bing or for Bing. Um, now, now, one interesting thing there is, and this is relevant to all our listeners, there are two experiences there. There's a consumer experience where your prompts will be used to train the underlying model moving forward and and it will incorporate that and there are no commercial data protections in it there's of course consumer data protections and and microsoft's privacy policy which is adhered to however there is also a experience that used to be called bing chat enterprise now it's just microsoft copilot for bing with commercial data protection uh but what that does is it gives you all of the commercial data protection you'd expect where your data is your data, your data is never used to train the underlying models, your prompts aren't used to go back into the model, and nobody has eyes on access to your data from Microsoft. Microsoft can't see what you're doing, essentially. And if you're, as of right now, you have to have a certain level of license. I think it's like Microsoft 365 E3, but we are expanding that to be, if you have an Entra ID account at all, a worker school account, as you may have seen it referred to, you can enable that for your company. And I believe it's been opted in by default, but your company may have turned it off. This is something you want to look at because if you turn this on and your users are signed in with their worker school account and they go to Microsoft Copilot for Bing, you get that commercial data protection automatically. And so nothing is used to go back and train the underlying models or anything else. So now if you've had concerns about your users using BARD or using uh, chat GPT or anything else because of the risks inherent with, again, training the underlying models, you can now redirect them to this experience, which does meet your commercial data protection requirements. As we always talk about on the show, we don't like the idea of taking something away that your users are using to be productive without providing a comparable replacement that's enterprise grade. Well, up until this point recently, you really haven't had a great choice for that, but now you do. So now you can say, please don't use chat GPT. Please don't use Bard. Use this because this does meet our enterprise grade data protection requirements. So, and I think that's kind of on topic for our next topic. Absolutely. There was a slew of announcements that talked about securing the use of generative AI. 
And one of the things that was quoted in, in the reports was 43% of organizations say the lack of controls to detect and mitigate risk in AI is a top concern, which is, I think that's actually kind of low compared to the organizations that I've talked to. Everyone is concerned about their users using it, data getting inputted into it, mm-hmm. being used to train the underlying model, um, corporate secrets getting revealed and not being able to purge them from the databases, so on and so forth, right? Mm-hmm. So now Defender for Cloud Apps, which is the CASB solution as part of the Microsoft security portfolio, is expanding discovery capabilities to help organizations gain visibility into generative AI app usage, as well as provide controls to uh, either protect and block the risky apps or apply some sort of policy to prevent data loss in AI prompts and AI responses. And so I didn't see a demonstration of this, but I'm assuming we're probably using some sort of uh, DLP to block if you're copying and pasting something into a prompt of an unmanaged application or, or a risky application within cloud apps, it will then tell you, hey, your organization does not allow this. And there's also new capabilities in Microsoft Purview to help you secure and govern the data in AI, not only in Copilot, but also in non-Microsoft generative AI applications. So customers of Microsoft Purview can gain visibility into AI activity, including sensitive data usage in the AI prompts, comprehensive uh, protection with ready-to-use policies to protect AI prompts and responses, and compliance controls that will help you meet business and regulatory requirements. And there's a new AI hub in Purview, which gives you an aggregated view of all the total prompts being sent to Copilot, the sensitive information included in those prompts. You can see an aggregated view of number of users interacting with Copilot and they, we've extended the capabilities to provide insight for more than 100 of the most commonly used ge- consumer generative AI applications, including ChatGPT, BARD, DALI, and more. So that is amazing to me to just be able to not only discover what apps your users are using, also looking at the prompts, seeing what type of s- sensitive data is being possibly leaked or asked in those prompts. I mean, the huge announcement here for security and compliance. Yeah, I, I think you can't just say, well, the answer is use all the Microsoft stuff, right? You've got to be able to have an answer for the explosion of these services. There's so many of them now. Of course, everyone's trying to get on the AI bandwagon, and some of that's going to appeal to your users. And so how do you manage this responsibly? One of the things I've pointed out is for the most part, you don't need new tooling to do this. You need to leverage the existing tooling. And so what a lot of this announcement is really around is it's not necessarily net new technology. It's about bringing it together in an easy to use way and bringing all that existing technology, surfacing it in in a single viewpoint. So I've talked about, you wanna do things like sensitivity labeling. If you have sensitivity labeling in place, and your crown jewels are protected with a protected label, it's already very, very hard to go take that data and leak it to a consumer AI application just natively. If you have a a robust endpoint DLP program in place, you can program your endpoint DLP to not allow stuff to go to some of these endpoints. But it does require you to know what they are. And that's the challenge is keeping up with this explosion of stuff. So now if I can go to a single place and say, hey, our approved generative AI is what I just talked about, Microsoft Copilot for Bing with commercial data protection. Nothing else is allowed. Now I basically have a single point of view where I can go restrict that access to those consumer grade tools. Really, really, really helpful. And that's gonna bring together sensitivity labeling, endpoint DLP, cloud app security, uh, Defender for Cloud Apps, I should say, and, and all that with just a couple of flips of a switch. And that's really, really helpful. The other thing you talked about is having that better understanding of how, like, say, Copilot's being used. And and so one of the things is that has to be an enterprise-grade solution for enterprises to want to use it. I need to be able to audit what's being plugged in. I need it to respect my existing uh, sensitivity labeling, as an example. So I don't know if you know this. This was announced there at Ignite. Let's say I have a document that's labeled as 
confidential. And I tell Microsoft 365 Copilot, hey, use this Word document to create a PowerPoint with eight slides summarizing the content of this Word document. Since it is that Word doc is the sensitivity label of confidential, the PowerPoint inherits that automatically. And even my chat around the content of it gets that label applied automatically. Just having that awareness of it and leveraging that existing work you've done to classify, label, and protect your documents, super powerful, super important for that to be an enterprise-grade tool. If it became a, a data leakage avenue where it can ingest stuff that's protected and then not protect it back on the way out, that'd be problematic. Well, luckily, that's not a problem because it does respect and understand that. So all of the things you need to do around, hey, communications compliance, is somebody asking Microsoft 365 Copilot to help harass a coworker or asking it questions around how to commit workplace violence. These are things we want to know about, and now you can discover them through those existing tool sets as well. So a lot here around helping organizations wrap their arms around both the first and third-party use of generative AI apps. And this show is already getting pretty long, but I wanted to add just a few last things that I thought were really, really cool. If you're a listener and fan of the show, you know that both Adam and I are big components of device management. We love, you know, using Intune and identity and we come from that background. Mm -hmm. So I did stay up on some of the things that were announced there. Number one, Microsoft is, uh, finally standing up their cloud PKI. We had talked about this kind of as a roadmap item way back when Intune Suite was announced and some of the things that were possibly part of it. It was announced as, I believe it's in preview, um, and it is basically a comprehensive cloud-based public key infrastructure certificate management solution uh, that you can use for managing certificates for authentication, Wi-Fi, VPN, you no longer have to deploy or configure managed on-premise servers to or procure any hardware in order to have your own PKI. You'll be able to create multiple certification authorities, manage lifecycle cert certificates to Intune manage machines. At launch, Cloud PKI will be able to issue certificates across platforms, so for Windows, iOS, Mac, and Android. So, I mean, that's huge. And then the other thing is Intune Enterprise App Management. This is something that has been asked for from customers for a very, very long time. If you've managed Intune and had to deploy applications, you remember that you have to, like, package it with this Intune-specific packager and then upload it. Well, now the apps are natively part of a comprehensive catalog along with Microsoft and third-party applications. And when you select the applications it will put in the metadata pre-filled with all the essentials where you don't have to like put in the install commands anymore it'll do that for you with install and uninstall commands which is huge because i am not very good at command line and so like understanding and finding what flags are you know for this application to uninstall or install and what folder it needs to go to all that's going to be built in it streamlines and consolidates the application process. So when a new version of that app comes out, you can easily update it without having to like upload and package a whole other thing. And so it, it, um, it really streamlined the whole application delivery process. So huge things on the Intune side. I thought those were pretty cool. I'd pick those out for you. These are coming to Intune Suite at no additional cost for existing Intune Suite customers. That's... Uh, delivering on the promise, these were announced, like you said, Andy, when Intune Suite was first announced, probably over a year ago now, and it was said, these are coming, there will be additional value coming to this suite. And so for customers who bought in early, they are being rewarded uh, with this great new technology. I will say some of the, the deepest <laughs> scar tissue I have when I was an Intune administrator was trying to get certificates stood up and working correctly. It was a bear and it, 
it was always hard to tell. Is it the SCEP server? Is it ADCS? Is it, uh, we were using Azure AD app proxy at the time. Like there was a million different things that could go wrong and trying to troubleshoot it was nightmarish. And then it worked on iOS fine, but it didn't work on Android. So the idea of a cloud service that set it and forget it, it stood up. All I need to do is tell it what I want to do. And it's going to get those certs to those endpoints across Mac OS, iOS, Android, and Windows is honestly incredible. If you, if you haven't done this, you may not appreciate just how hard this is. Let me tell you how bad I think certificates are to manage. I compared them, wait for it, to printers. <laughs> for all my IT people out there who know like printers are the most nightmarish thing to deal with. Certificate delivery is right up there with that. So man, if there's software as a service to help deliver certificates to my endpoints, I am all freaking ears. This is incredible. And then enterprise app management, I still wanna learn more about this myself, but just listening to Andy describe it based on what I already know, just, just making it easier for admins to not only just deploy Microsoft software, but all of their software. and and bringing all that knowledge together in kind of a single point of view, a single database, that's, that's really incredible too, because that's one of those things where for whatever reason, we just don't do a good job of as an industry on like consolidating that knowledge and making it available in a single place because at practically every enterprise IT shop, there is someone who's like your packaging guru and they know all the switches for all the different installers. And in this one, it's a slash quiet and this one, it's this. And I don't know if there's a single good resource like on the web to go look all that up or I could go look up and say, Hey, how do I install Adobe creative suite versus how do I install notepad plus plus versus seven zip. And it's all in one spot. And so just being able to, go through that list and have that all in one place. Microsoft has so many customers. If you get it right, it's going to work for everyone. And if you get it wrong, you're going to find out really quickly it's wrong and you can fix it. That's leveraging that scope and skill for good. And I love that idea. So I'm, I, I think really uh, you combine these with some of the other capabilities of Intune Suite, like the endpoint privilege management and remote help and you really have a lot of super useful tools for our endpoint management homies out there um, to, to really wrap their arms around all of the challenges of endpoint management and do it under one roof. So huge, huge announcements here. Very exciting. Yep. Yeah. If you're like a Tanium customer or like a patch my PC, this is basically a tool that, or solution that is trying to do the many things that those tools are doing. So um, I think the value of Intune Suite is rising. You know, you can basically replace things like BombCard, TeamViewer, you know, in your organization with remote help. There's unique capabilities like this Cloud PKI, Endpoint Privilege Management, which is huge. We've talked about it on our show, but if you haven't heard of that, you know, ways to provide privileged access without providing full local admin, very good for security, right? And then you have this, enterprise app management, which is just a way to, you know, deliver your applications um, that frankly, Microsoft customers have been going to third parties for a very long time. And now it's going to be part of that Intune suite as no additional cost. Also good for security, keeping your applications up to date and patched. Yes. Very good. <laughs> All right. This was our first half and it was <laughs> a lot. We're going to have another show on some more Ignite stuff because I just couldn't fit it into all one show. So stay tuned. We're going to have another one coming up. But this is the end of our show for this week. Thanks for listening and watching. As always, we'll have links within the show notes to all the things we talked about as well as our contact information. If you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about in the future, please reach out to us. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.